Um, just to say that Rand Paul, when I was a young journalist here, was the billions room for MPs only, and I think only male MPs at the time, and it was the holy of holies. You have been in the holy of holies. This place, of course, is extinct. So you are here. Is this the future or is this the past? Uh, you may want to cogitate on that point. I'm going to start with a couple of... Uh, I'm, Chris, I can't imagine you being extinct. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> Chris, that's uh, I'm going to start with a couple of quotes. One is from, uh, I think, one of Australia's foremost authors, Peter Carey. It says, it's a quote from one of his novels. You say things about the future, but you've not been there, so you cannot know. Um, and another quote is from uh, Neil Ferguson in Complexity and Collapse in Foreign Affairs magazine, March, April 2010. The political and economic structures made by humans share many of the features of complex adaptive, adaptive systems. A small input to such a system can produce huge, often unanticipated changes. Causal relationships are often non-linear, which means that traditional methods of generalizing through observation, such as trend analysis and sampling, are of little use. When things go wrong in a complex system, the scale of disruption is nearly impossible to anticipate. And we are dealing with the human society, which is a very complex system. So I just want to look at the past, and I've, I've, uh, in my background paper I've done two 50-year scans from 1910 and 1960. Well, I actually haven't done the scans, I've just indicated the unpredicted discontinuities. If you were predicting 50 years ahead in 1910, you would not have predicted two devastating world wars, penicillin, the splitting of the atom, the bikini, the invention of the transistor, the DNA double helix, the first space satellite, all of those occurred before 1960. You would not have predicted, probably, unless you were astonishingly good an analyst of political affairs, the triumph of communism in Russia and China. At home, you would not have predicted aerial top dressing. Uh, and uh, uh, you, wouldn't have, you would have thought the welfare state, which came in 1938 in New Zealand, would have been utopian. Even if you were doing a 20-year scan from 1910, you would have missed the First World War, Communist Russia, penicillin splitting the atom, and the 1929 stock market crash. So just beware of the unpredictable discontinuities. I've got another list for 1960 which you can run through, but I'll just start with a reference to uh, one item in your booklet of the, uh, the uh, National Development Conference in 1968-1969. I was a very young journalist and I covered it wide-eyed at the time. And that, that had indicative planning. It set, set targets for 10 years for the various sectors of the economy. Lots of earnest people gathered in sectors uh, and uh, met over a period of months and uh, gathered in a plenary in May uh, uh, 1969. Well, you would not have predicted the Manapuri petition, which ra uh, radically changed uh, the Manapuri uh, uh, power scheme and led indirectly to the emergence, and that was only two years, that was only one year later, and led indirectly two years on from that to the world's first national Green Party. You would not have predicted the quintupling of the oil price in 1973, which had caused real damage to the global economy. You would not have predicted the collapse of Bretton Woods. Now we've got up, uh, so far we've got up to 1973. Uh, if you want to go to 1978, you've got Baston Point and Rankin Golf Course in New Zealand. You would not have predicted any of those things. So when you're predicting, when you're looking at the future, uh, any attempt to build platforms of resilience to make the most of that future must recognise that there will be large discontinuities. So history, you might say is full of unpredicted pasts. Uh, uh, full, sorry, full of unpredicted futures. So good luck on the predictions out to 2021. Uh, you need to know who and what you are, and that is the point of an exercise like this. If you know who and what you are, you will handle those discontinuities much better. I start with some global reference points, and I bear in mind the impossibility of uh, predicting these. Uh, discontinuities, but here's my starting points globally, that we will continue intercon interconnectedness and interdependency will continue to be, through the next 10 years, a feature. That's the globalization of information, finance, production, and importantly, people uh, will uh, continue. And that will uh, fuel interstate 
and intrastate tensions, or potentially will do that, uh, and may result in attempts by states or political movements within states to stall or reverse elements of the globalising process. Uh, so the, uh, and I expect that the once monolithic state is likely to fragment and or diversify and or operate differently. And if I think of that interconnectedness, uh, if, you, if the United States were to block Chinese imports because they got annoyed about the exchange rate, Apple would lose $2 billion in revenue from its iPhone alone. So the United States would actually be acting against its own interests to do so. And another interesting point last year, call center wages in the United States are the same as those in India. So uh, my next point is that inequalities within economies will persist. Uh, and that in established rich economies, they may continue to grow as lower income activities come under competition uh, from emerging economies. Inequalities between economies will diminish, particularly for routine, readily replicable activities. That is, the world is flat. So those engaged in non-routine, high knowledge in intensive activities will command high incomes, however, and that will be set by global demand, the global elite as redefined over the past 25 years, is likely to maintain its ascendancy. So that's an issue of inequalities, and they are, will be an important feature of the uh, next 10 years or so. And where will they show themselves? Uh, in cities. Uh, cities will drive a lot of the activity. So that, what sort of cities? Fast industrializing cities. They're en route to being post-industrial centers. And cities that are spikes, uh, where uh, uh, aggregations of people who are engaged in those non-routine, high knowledge intensive activities. New Zealand will not have cities in either category. We will have to work out how to connect. Uh, global interconnectedness will enable criminal and terrorist activity. Some of it a state-backed cyber warfare. I can go on about that if you want. Uh, I, the, uh, there will be uh, intensified competition for resources, energy, metals, minerals, food, and water, uh, possibly to the point of major and devastating conflict as there are periodic price spikes and shortages. Uh, and uh, the means to offset that uh, by 2030 or so are unlikely to come fast enough or spread widely enough to effect a smooth transition. If there is atmospheric and oceanic warming of the degree outlined by the International Panel on Climate Change, this may predict, uh, precipitate famine, disease, and interstate conflict and may displace populations in low-lying island territories or places uh, which become drier. China will continue its rise through the next 10 or 20 years and consequently its exercise of soft and hard power will increase. Increasingly, and this is important, new ideas will come from China. New science, uh, new ideas about social and political organisation. They will not be comfortable to those of us who've grown up with 500 years of Western Type ideas. But China's rise is highly unlikely to be linear and even. Water problems, access to resources, pollution, social and political tensions, bureaucratic mistakes and a post-2020 workforce shortage uh, thanks to the one-child policy coupled with interstate tensions uh, will likely cause some disruptions and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, not just in China but also affect global security and economic shocks. If there is a war, it will be like none seen before, just like the First World War was like none seen before, and I mentioned cyber warfare before. And then India will also develop and exercise greater soft and hard power, but about 20 years behind China. The relative global influence of the United States of Europe will diminish, thus ending a half a millennium of Atlantic domination. The empire will end. Science and technology will continue to drive some fast, and deep changes in economic opportunity, in resource availability and use, in human health and longevity, in connectivity and social control, and the capacity for destruction. Major areas that I would single out are artificial intelligence, GPS and other ICT technologies, and antidotes to preserve privacy and liberty, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, RNA interference, epigenetics, energy technology. But there's no compelling reason to believe science will forever continue to ensure self, uh, safe and self-sustaining ecosystems in the face of over-exploitation. What New Zealand's starting points in this? We have a number 
of attractive natural comparative advantages in this country. We have water in abundance in a water constrained world. We have a relatively benign climate, less affected by climate change than almost anywhere else. We have the capacity to grow high quality food in a food short world. We have abundant sources of energy in an energy constrained world. Uh, we have distance from mayhem and we are a safe haven. Uh, we have a great marketing brand, clean, green, 100% pure, and a strong reputational brand, fresh, safe, natural. All of that will make New Zealand highly desirable over the next 20 years or so. And we have some institutional, cultural, and social comparative advantages. We have strong institutions by world standards, rule of law, very low corruption, stable political system, high ease of doing business. Uh, we have high ranking of prosperity measures that go, that go beyond simple GDP per capita. We're an attractive stepping stone for immigrants. We have a reasonably good education system that's in need of rethinking. We have an inventive and adaptive population. We have a by and large tolerant society. We know violence on the route to a bicultural society. Uh, other major starting characteristics are we have a globalised economy and society. We have an unbalanced economy. That's the legacy of the bubble mentality of the 2000s. We have a rapidly Polynesianising society. It's Māori and Pacifica. And that's increasingly of the Pacific, not just in the Pacific. Uh, and increasingly the mainstream culture reflects that indigenous culture and custom. We have a rapidly Asianising society. We have a rapidly Australasianising society. We have a society that's also reaching the end of its population bonus, which has been a factor in past economic growth. And we have some down points. We have lost a sense of progress and the striving that goes with that. We don't save because we have a strong sense of entitlement. We immigrate to Australia and beyond in large numbers. We have great difficulty in retaining our elite. We're still essentially an extractive economy, primary products, landscape, tourism, rather than a human capital-based economy living off innovative ideas. We're very small and our supply lines are very long. And as to those brands, we're not actually clean green, we're dirty and brown, but empty. In short, I would characterise New Zealand as a starting point for your future, a, as a rich, developing country, but we put the emphasis on rich, which makes us defensive. Instead of, uh, so issues are problems, instead of on developing, which would engender an outgoing, achieving mentality, uh, seeing issues as opportunities. So, some assumptions about New Zealand's next two decades or so. Australia will continue to loom large. The ethnic Polynesian proportion of the population will continue to grow, uh, although I think the treaty is likely to lose some forces of drive by 2030. Um, Iwi will become a stronger economic force. The ethnic Asian proportion of the population is likely to grow. The economy will increasingly be owned by Asian economic <coughs> interests, particularly Chinese and India. The climate will be affected to only a limited extent, even though uh, even through 50 years, but sea level rises and changes in rain patterns may become significant over, the, over time. The considerable petroleum, coal, silicon and other mineral reserves will be proven and extracted in significant quantities, mainly with foreign capital. Uh, and there may be increasing interest in New Zealand as a safe haven from terror, climate change and overcrowding with constant with consequent pressure on politicians to define and preserve the brand uh, safe, fresh, secure, well governed. And we will get better at taking ideas to scale. So, finally, some possible dis discontinuities in the next decade or so um, major war, nuclear, biological, or cyber ter terrorism, severe resource bottlenecks and constraints, severe food and water shortages, a lurching climate change, a virulent pandemic a breakdown of the internet and, and related cyber-based systems, a great leap forward in, com in combining epigenetics, RNA-based bioscience, synthetic biology and nanoscience to predict and control disease and physical disability, major innovations in energy and rapid spread of the technologies, and sudden global recognition of and action on the threats to ecosystems with interesting ramifications uh, to the sovereignty of the nation state. If I come to New Zealand, what are the discontinu potential discontinuities? Well, we know about earthquakes, uh, and um, uh, it, we've, we've now been reminded of that. A volcanic eruption in Taranaki or Auckland, 
serious interracial or interethnic strife as we adapt to large uh, minorities, large and unmanageable influxes of climate refugees default on sovereign debt. Ah, time to emigrate. Um, those are just the discontinuities. There is a steady state alternative. It is possible that the world is headed towards a sort of steady state social and economic conditions that preceded the rise of Newtonian science, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, and European imperialism. But even if so, that is most unlikely in the next 50 years because of the continued rapid development of science, demographic change, and environmental constraints. Thank you.